I'm sure that a lot of people here would like to ask you questions and talk to you. Maybe some of them don't know that you're actually, apart from the Danish girl, which made you so popular, you're also a, a very popular playwright. So you write a lot of theater, which amazes me as well. And uh, so uh, we'll get to the Danish girl after, of course, eventually, inevitably. So, or so, you can go, you can go if you like, you can join us. But, uh, I mean, uh, so we can go maybe slow back in time, so from the, you know, when you started. You started first with writing for the theater, or you jumped directly to, to the film and television industry? No, I started out working in the theater, and when I was, um, when I was still at school, when I was a teenager, I, I worked in my local theater uh, as a dresser in the evenings, and um, so all I really wanted to do was work in the theater. Uh, and I think I didn't know any living playwrights, then, so I it never occurred to me that it, to to be a writer really. So I thought about acting, and I thought about directing, and I thought about stage managing. And uh, then I went to university. I studied English, and as soon as I finished my degree, I wrote a play without really have thinking about it too much. I, I kind of uh, I wrote a play, and then we I put the play on with some friends in a very dirty room above a very dirty pub in London. Um, and uh, it, it, it was fantastic, and I, I really haven't done very much else since then. You know, there's a bit of me that is still in a dirty room above a dirty pub in London, working on plays. That's what I, that's what I, that's what I like. But um, but I transitioned from working with theatre to working in film very, kind of actually, relatively easily and um, and happily. And I, it's great to be able to move between the two. I think it's. I was say to people, it's uh, it's fantastic because the it's both really wonderful fields, but they're also quite challenging fields. And if you work with both, it's like having a wife and a mistress. So when you fall out with one, you're like, oh my God, why is this person impossible? You go to the other for some consolation. When that goes wrong, you go back to the... So that's how I work between film and theatre. It's, uh, it's, it's a very comfortable combination for me. Also, also it's the television as well you wrote uh, for the TV series. I mean, does it where the TV uh, fits yeah, between w w wife and mistress, is it? <laughs> yeah, I don't really... TV is, is like a, a, my dirty secret. Uh, it, no, I, I don't really work much in TV. I, I, I don't... Uh, although, I, I mean, I may in the future. That... Uh, I wrote a mini-series uh, called The Crimson Path and the White that was really terrific. I was very lucky. I had a really amazing director and amazing designers and actors. And so it turned out very well, but I think mostly, you know, historically period drama. This was a, a, a drama set in the Victorian period. That kind of that kind of material can look very bad on TV. We there's a way of making that kind of drama in in the UK that's actually sometimes very popular abroad, but I really hate it. And so I was very worried that it would end up like that. But it, I was lucky, and I had very good colleagues, um, really wonderful artists to work with, and. But I really didn't think of it as a TV series. I, I thought of it as a four-hour film that we happened to show in four parts. So I, I wrote it like a film. I don't, I don't, I don't know how else to do it. Uh, so I just, yeah, I wrote it like a film. I, I've never been really attracted to long-form television, which is, there's a lot of long-form television around now, and I get offered it a lot, and I... So something like The Handmaid's Tale, which has just been, you know, a huge success. I haven't, I haven't watched it because I was approached about the job, and... And I was very excited because I love that novel and you get to work with Margaret Atwood, which is very exciting. And then they said, we want to make five seasons and it's, it's going to be 10 episodes per season. And I suddenly thought, my God, that's 50 episodes. I can't, that's like the next 10 years of my life. I can't do that. So um, I have to walk my dog. You know, I, I don't have time for that stuff. Um, so I, I, yeah, I, I'm, I don't really like that kind of commitment makes me feel ill. So four hours, I think it's probably my max. Yeah, so TV, not so much. I mean, how, how uh, that, I mean, technique, right? if that's the right word, but how, how do you, I mean, you, you've been commissioned, let's say, for a play or a screen, or for a screen or for television, and then do you get, I mean, from them, like a subjects they want to write, you want to write, or you, you get your own ideas? How, how, how does it work, actually? Uh, well, I have a 
quite a strict division where I write an original material for the theatre and I adapt for film. Um, and I just don't write original material for the screen. I think I might do that if I were also a director. I'm always kind of envious of writer-directors. But I think if you... Yeah, for me, it's become a very happy arrangement that I, the original material is for uh, the stage and the adapted stuff is for film. Um, it's much easier to get an adaptation made, financed and made, is the unhappy truth. Um, but I think also I... I had a kind of formative experience <laughs> with writing original material for film a long time ago. My first film, my first screenplay, was something I'd worked on for a long time. It was a very personal story, of course, etc., etc. I was young and foolish, and I put everything into this movie, and it was very exciting. It was going to be made, and halfway through the shoot, the the leading lady, who was in fact was Winona Ryder, was starring in the movie, and um, she became ill, and uh, the movie shot down. Um, we, we couldn't replace her fast enough uh, to, to keep shooting. And so I think the film became one of the... At the time, it was the biggest insurance case in British film history. And it means that that script, which was, you know, my script that I worked on for years, that was very personal, um, is owned by an insurance company. I can't touch that script again. So it's a very strange thing to have something, you know, that you've created owned by an insurance company. Uh, and so I, I realize that's the thing. If you're a writer and you're working in film with original material, you can lose control of that material in all sorts of ways. Of course, you can lose control of it if you end up with a crazy director, which people do occasionally. I, I've been reasonably lucky in that sense. I've mostly had very good directors, but you can lose control of the material, and when it's gone, it's gone. Yeah, you mentioned the, the working with directors, and uh, you, you didn't direct yourself yet. I've directed a bit in the theatre, just enough to, um, just enough to kind of know that I'm probably not a director. Uh, <laughs> I think the only, if you're working with a not so good director, I've certainly in some on occasions when I've I've, I've worked with not good directors in the theatre, I've I've almost take, ended up taking over. When I've, and that's usually been when I've uh, yeah working not in the UK, working in the States with less good directors, but. I think it's only when you're working with a not very good director you think, my God, I should be a director. When you're working with a good director, you think, my God, have some humility. I, you have no idea. So at the moment, I'm just, um, I've just started shooting a movie in the UK with a director called Lenny Abrahamson, who uh, made a film called Room uh, last year that will be last and won the Oscar for it. It's a really brilliant film, and he's a really brilliant director, Irish director. He was Oscar nominated for the film. And you know, if you're working with somebody like that, you don't think, oh, maybe I should direct, because, you know, this is a really incredibly skilled individual, and uh, it's like, you know, I could make my own shoes, but I don't, because they would look really bad, you know, and other people are really good at making shoes, so just because it's possible doesn't mean you should do it. But you also, I mean, uh, there were quite good directors, others that worked on your scripts, like Tom Hooper, the Danish Girl, and... Uh, Del Toro with uh, Crimson Peak, the dilemma Del Toro. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, do you? I mean, uh, how do they treat your script? I mean, do they uh, do they have these tendencies of like uh, putting their own stuff, of changing few scenes? And I mean, do they do they work with you then? If you have some other things that uh, that I mean that uh, inspire them during the filming or pre. Pre, pre-production, do you work with them closely or do you just hand out uh, the script and then see the movie at the end? No, I've, I, I've, um, I've worked pretty closely with all my directors, apart from uh, Guillermo del Toro, That's a slightly, that was a slightly different case, but um, I, yeah, I mean, if the script is the script and uh, we, I work in rehearsal with them beforehand, but I, you know, they will phone me from the set and say, we, we would like to change this line, how do you feel about that? Or, we, you know, we, we've got a problem with the location, we need to change something, and then I'll rewrite it. But they don't, uh, they don't change the script on set. So I've had very respectful uh, and trusting directors uh, w with whom I've kind of collaborated very happily. With Del Toro, it's a slightly different thing that I... I he had already begun that work on that project, and he brought me in to rewrite with him. And, you know, he I've never rewritten anything before or since. But and I don't particularly want to get into that. That's a big industry, doing lucrative rewrites. There's a lot of that work around, um, if you're a, a writer in London, certainly. 
and but with Guillermo, you know, he's a he's a, he's a huge brand, <laughs> and he's a huge character, and his his vision is is kind of overwhelming. So there was never any question that this was going to be a Guillermo del This was not going to be a Lucinda Coxon film. This was going to be a you know Guillermo's movie, and so that was um, he overwrote me, and he writes on set, and so. I, I haven't even seen the film. I mean, that was always going to be his film, and I helped him with it, you know, along the way. And he—he's a wonderful colleague. He's a fabulous uh, collaborator. But, but you know, it's—it was that was his project, and I kind of came in and helped with it, and that was very exciting to be able to to do that. I'm, I'm sure that everybody's waiting for the questions about Danish girls. So I'm jumping. <laughs> To the Danish group. We, we were lucky to, to show the film last year here in Prefest. And it was also part of the program, we call it uh, Let It Be, which is about LGBT uh, films, pro I mean, theme films. And it went really well there. Uh, I mean, in Pristina, it was a full house, and we were very happy about it and, and proud. And so, yeah, can you tell us something about uh, how? How did you start working on the script on, on the Danish Girl? It was a long journey, The Danish Girl. I was, um, it, it began, I think it was 11 years before we made the film. I was approached by uh, an American producer, two American producers, two women, in fact, really wonderful independent producers who had optioned a novel called The Danish Girl. And they sent it to me and, um, and I read it and I, I'd never heard of this story, this true story before, uh, and it seemed extraordinary that it had been lost in history. But, you know, I mean, it's not surprising given the timing. Um, given you know, Lily, Lily Albert died in Dresden in the early 1930s. Given what happened in Dresden ten years later, you know, what, what was happening in Germany in the period, it's not surprising that story got lost. And women's history tends to get lost, and queer history tends to get lost, um, and so. I, I kind of started researching the story a little bit more. There wasn't that much material available uh, about it, but I so and the novel was good, and uh, but it also had it, there was a lot of fictionalization on on top of the story. The story had been very expanded, um, and so I stripped it back as much as I could uh, to the marriage to to these two because it seemed to me that was what was extraordinary about it was this sort of lifelong relationship between these two people that withstood this extraordinary kind of change and these extraordinary challenges um, and it was also above all these things the relationship between two artists uh, and that I found really fascinating so I um, yeah so I uh, we had a script relatively quickly and I think pretty good script pretty quickly uh, you know something that we were not embarrassed to send out to people but and we were very excited. You know, when you fall in love with a project, you think, oh my God, everybody's going to love this. This is going to be so easy because it's so great and everyone will be able to see that it's just wonderful. And we sent it out and people just kind of went, yuck. <laughs> really, people would just said, oh, you know, we, nobody wants to see that. Nobody wants to see that film. Nobody wants to hear that story. And actors wanted to be involved with it. Directors wanted to be involved with it. Financiers were just, you know, said, we, you've got to be kidding. Uh, and... We had lots of different, you know, the, we had incredible names attached to the project. I can't remember. We've had, I mean, there were so many women in particular attached to the project. We Nicole Kidman for a long time, Charlize Theron, Rachel Weisz, Marion Cotillard. I mean, it's, you know, they were all at some point going to make, Kate Winslet, they were all going to make the film at some point. And um, we could never get the package together. Many directors, also fantastic directors. It was good for me because I met so many, you know, great directors. It's like, yeah. Uh, Thomas Alfredson uh, was going to direct it, and then the, it, his schedule fell through, and the financing fell through. Lasse Hallstrom was going to direct it, uh, and Anne Tucker, British director. And after King's speech, he he was saying to her, "I'm being sent all these scripts, and I can't find anything I like." And she said, "Oh well, you know, what about my, you know, what about the Danish girl? I have this lying around the office." And so he read it, and he said he loved it, but he he was committed to making Les Misérables. And so he, he went off and, you know, making him as a marvel is a very long, it's a saga, you know, it takes a long time. And so he went off and did that and then he came back and I think I thought he had really moved on and it had become a very, uh, a much bigger story. I mean, this was still before Caitlyn Jenner, but it was, but it was a little nervous. Um, but Tom brought this kind of, just brought money. What was interesting about Eddie's casting 
from a kind of political point of view is that, that a lot of people in the transgender community were upset that we had cast a cis male actor in a, in a, in a, in a trans female uh, role. Um, and I think, I mean, I can defend that decision very happily and the, the truth is, as I'm sure everybody here knows, you, we could not have made the film. Thank you. The book was written in 2000 and 11 years in the making. What made you so stick to it? I think, you know, I, I never thought of it as um, as a transgender project. I didn't, you know, it's it's become, people now say to me, oh, and you made this transgender project, and I don't, it's like saying, oh, have you met my gay son? I mean, I never thought of it as, you know, that project. I, I thought of it as a, as a love story, uh, first and foremost, the portrait of a, of a marriage and, and a portrait of, of artists. And um, I think... Uh, I found it endlessly fascinating to to look at these lives that were so that were so courageous and also so kind of winning, so stylish. And you know, these were really these are these are people who are aesthetically kind of ahead of the curve. Uh, Gerda Vena is an extraordinary artist. She's a really wonderful painter. And in fact, one of the great things that came out of the film is that there was a huge retrospective show, the first ever big show of her work in Copenhagen. Um, and that was, that's been kind of a record-breaking show, but she, she'd been, you know, again, her art history had been buried. So it's great to have been part of that, but I, I, I think it also felt like a project that wouldn't date. So we were just, every year, we were trying to get the film made, and um, I think one of the things that was remarkable about it is I had, had fantastic producers. They didn't lose faith in me. There was no moment where, sometimes with producers, they can say, you know what? It's five years, we, didn't, we haven't got the film made, let's fire the writer and get somebody else. <laughs> let's change something. And the writer is a cheap thing to change. So uh, they didn't do that. So we, we, had, we, we kept faith with each other. I think there was a sense that, she, that they were always together, in fact, and that, that there's no question that, that Lily was still the most significant uh, person in her life. Uh, I think for both of them, they, they were still very tied together. And I think, uh, I'd like to think that, you know, that today, in that situation, they would be able to stay together. I think Gerda Venner would have been very happy to be in a, in a lesbian relationship with Lily Alba, but Lily Alba didn't want to do that. And the last question, uh, did you consult any trans women while or through the writing of the script? Yeah, I spoke, at, not at the beginning, to be honest, because I think at the be in some ways I was very lucky that I started it a long time ago. If, if you came to me with this book now, I would think twice about the politics of taking it on. Do you know? I would think, as a kind of cis woman, do I feel uh, entitled to write this story? And I think that's sad, actually, that I would feel that way. But I would. I would, I would feel a kind of anxiety about it. Um, but I think when I first took it on, it, it, the really good thing is that I, I wasn't anxious about that. And I, I was interested in in them, you know, in their entirety, um, not just the trans element, because it seems to me that although in some ways it is a story about transgender, it is also uh, it, it's also a story about a lot of other things, and that's that's and to de define uh, Lily Elba in that way would be and get it would be wrong. So I did later on. I mean, I suppose a, a few years in, um, I, uh, I I had lots more lots of conversations with. Uh, particularly young sort of teenage uh, 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 trans people who were looking to transition both both uh, in both directions I um, the first thing to do I would say with an adaptation is you have to kill people the first thing you have to do is you just be really ruthless and you know in the novel of the Danish girl for example Gerda Vena has a brother and he's a really big character in the story and I just killed him day one he was gone so that's like good that's 50 pages gone um, and it's, it, it's, so it, it, I think it's really different with different novels. And different, one is attracted to source material for different reasons. And some, some novels, it's so much about atmosphere. And some novels, it's really about kind of the spine of the story. Danish Girl was very straightforward. I was like, I, I read the novel and I, I really admired the novel enormously, but I spent a lot of time thinking, what is all this stuff that's in my way? I need to get to the couple, you know, I just need it to be about. So it's about, with that it was about focusing down, and then, um, you know, it, it's, it's, I wanted it to feel quite claustrophobic, I mean, the writing felt quite claustrophobic. You were in a room with those two people who were in quite an intense state, sort of all the time. There's not a huge amount of relief in the, in the, in the script or the film. 
um, in a sense. And uh, so it, then it was just about making that true. And I think the Danish girl is a particular challenge, which is that you need at the beginning of the film to, to believe that Aina Vena is is a man, that he's, and you have no questions about that. You, he presents himself to you in the film as a man, uh, who's maybe he's complicated, maybe he's a little socially awkward, but he's, but he's male. Um, and by the end of the film, you have to forget, you have to believe that Lily is a woman, and you have to forget that Einar ever existed. And I think, so it's a very strange journey that you're kind of erasing your own footprints in the sand, in a sense, as you go. Um, and it has to be, that transition has to be kind of seamless. Obsession now with gender purity, but, uh, but certainly in that period, if you, and there, is a, there, are, there are a few letters and a little bit of diary, you know, memoir, uh, research material to, to look at, that, that Lily wanted nothing to do with Ina. She didn't, what, Ina was dead and gone, and she, she felt that he was nothing to do with her. And she was entirely her own kind of creation. Well, and I think that's, I don't believe that particularly, but that was the, you know, that's what we're, that was what she want people, wanted people to think. And, but I think it's, what I always thought was really fascinating about is I know was a, he was quite a, a skilled landscape artist. Uh, and people always said, oh, and then, you know, the, there's the transition to Lily and then uh, the painter disappears.